Welcome to Simplified Concepts of Generative AI. I'm Anthony and I'm a Python programmer. And over the last year, I've been doing more and more programming with generative AI. And one thing I've struggled with is the number of new terms and quite honestly, really complicated concepts that people keep throwing at me. I mean, do I really need to know all these things? Do I need to know about vector search, tokens, token limits, byte pair encodings? I'm not trying to build a generative AI myself. I'm not trying to create some groundbreaking algorithm. I'm just trying to use the technology in ways that are useful. I'm not a math major either. I'm not an AI scientist. I'm not a physicist either. But I can still play pool and I don't need to know all the equations for working out the trajectory of the ball. But it definitely helps if you understand some of the principles. So that's what I wanted to do in this video is to go over some of the principal concepts in generative AI. And in particular, we're gonna go over tokens, vectors, and similarity. Take OpenAI's API as an example. When I started using this, it was asking me to populate things like the temperature or to provide my text as a vector of tokens. And I didn't really know what these things mean. And I foolishly assumed that you could just use the API, give it some data and it would give you something smart out. So really how much do you need to understand about generative AI to use it effectively? I don't wanna learn everything. Like I said, I don't wanna build my own generative AI. I just wanna use this technology. And I think the answer to that question is gonna change a lot over the next few years. If you took early programming languages like assembly and C, you needed to understand how a computer manages memory and data. It was really kind of raw access to those things. But over time, programming languages have evolved and abstractions have been put on top of memory management, for example, or data structures. I think generative AI will be similar, but at the moment, you still need to know quite a bit about the guts of how it works. And in time, I think that's gonna become easier. But do you really wanna sit by and wait until things get easier before you wanna use probably what's the biggest technology trend in the last couple of decades? Uh, the other option, I guess, would just be to guess and just stick random numbers in all the fields. Um, a lot of the terminology and complexity with generative AI is related to numbers. And computers are brilliant with numbers. Computers speak in numbers but a lot of generative AI is designed for training and learning patterns of numbers. And with generative AI, we're often giving it text, we're not giving it binary. So the AI needs to understand how it can turn those things into numbers and train itself so it gives us a sensible output. Another huge challenge with generative AI is that humans are vague. We give really vague instructions, we give incorrect instructions, we phrase things differently. Have you ever sent a friend a text message and they've completely misconstrued what you meant by it? Well, imagine what the poor AI has to do to figure out exactly what you meant in your question when you're just typing it in on your phone. So that's what we wanna cover in this video. I wanted to cover three concepts. The first one is text as tokens. Uh, the second one is text as vectors. And the third one is similarities and vectors. And we're gonna briefly mention read augmented generation because that kind of ties those things together. So I mentioned that computers are good at numbers. So if we gave an AI a bit of text, like some African animals include the rhino, lion, and hippopotamus, then it needs to really understand. And then if we trained on similar bits of text, it would need to understand the patterns. And to do that, it needs to convert those things into numbers. You could encode that text into binary using like Unicode or something, um, but it's not really gonna understand the relationship between the words or the structure of the sentence. It's just gonna identify the individual characters and the output will really be nonsense. Um, you could give each word a unique identifier so some is one, African is two, animals is three. Um, and then you could kind of build a model based on that. But the eagle-eyed amongst you would have noticed that I spelt hippopotamus wrong. Uh, that's hippopost, Uh So I don't know, after death hippo. Um, and your model would therefore have to create a 
uh, unique identifier for every possible combination of a spelling mistake or word. And also you're not just feeding it the English language, you're going to feed it text in all sorts of different languages um, and all the different combinations of spelling mistakes. And the number of different unique things you would need would be massive. So instead, LLMs use byte pair encodings. These encodings are unique identifiers for whole words, parts of words, or symbols that are frequently seen in text. Generally, the lower the number, the more frequently it occurs. And also it's case sensitive. So for our text, the capitalization of the words is important. You'll have noticed the misspelling of hippopotamus has been dealt with by breaking it into five separate tokens. And since spaces precede most words in written text, the encoding includes the word and the space. If the space is missing, it's probably part of another word. Some other benefits of byte pair encodings are that it's reversible, unlike vectors, which we'll cover later, and it's lossless, so the use of capitalizations, misspellings, they're all kept. It works with nonsense, like hippopostumus, but it compresses very well for most texts, and it works for all languages. The rarer the language, the more tokens per word. And because English is the most frequently used language in the training set, the tokens per word strongly favours English. So you'll find that a lot of English words have one token. However, if you were to use another language, you'll find it's actually more like four or five tokens per word. So the system is to take the text, give it to a byte pair encoder, which uses an encoding to convert it into a list of tokens, which could be, if you wanted to, turned back into text at a later date. So here's a demo on the OpenAI website using the CL100K base encoding, which is called CL100K because it has 100,000 tokens. CL100K is the model to use with OpenAI, but there are other encodings for other models. So if I give it my text, in the demo in the website, you can see live what the tokens are and what the token IDs are as well. To do this programmatically, you would use a tokenizer. For Python, the most popular one is TickToken, uh, which is made by OpenAI. Okay, so once you have this list of numbers, the tokens, what can you do with it? So uh, we would use it to make more numbers. So with our tokens, we use a text embedding to work out what our text means in vector space, which is a representation of how text relates to other text. The text embedding requires a model and would spit out a list of vectors. Now I've just chucked a whole another load of concepts at you. So before we go there, let's go back to our African animals. Now, if we took a simple question for ChatGPT as an example, what animals might I see in Africa? This in itself is a terrible question because like I said before, humans are vague. Africa is a huge continent and it has lots of countries and it has a massive and very diversity of wildlife as well. I would expect ChatGPT to give me not what animals I might see in Africa, literally, which is probably birds, butterflies, uh, and a lot of antelope. That's probably the, the, I mean, that's probably factually the correct answer. I would expect ChatGPT to give me a bunch of famous sub-Saharan African animals like Ryan, Linos, and zebras. So if you're visiting Egypt, for example, it's pretty unlikely you're going to see a lion um, you might see some aardvarks, which would be really cool, but no, no lions. So let's ask ChatGPT to see the answers. So I'm going to Africa. What animals might I see? Uh, as expected, actually, it did give me a nice preamble saying that Africa is known for its diverse wildlife. But it then goes on to say you would see an African lion, uh, an African elephant, a lion, a buffalo, a leopard, a rhino, a cheetah. Um, and... I've been on safari, it's incredibly difficult to see a cheetah. <laughs> and that was not my question, which animals might I see? Um, so why is that? Why has it, like we predicted, talked about the big five? And um, why has it not really directly answered my question, but given me the most obvious answer? Uh, and that's because the text that it was trained on would have uh, a lot of websites out there where people write about the animals they saw in Africa and they're going to mention the famous ones like lions, cheetahs and rhinos. So the model starts to build up a connection between the words African animals and those animals that then come after that in the sentences. And the more it sees of this, the stronger the connection is. So it's going to think, okay, African animals 
is Lion, Rhino, Cheetah and the, the other big ones. Um, if enough people wrote about this hippopostumus that I made up, it would start telling you that it might, you might see one of those in Africa. Um, but sadly, the one enthusiastic kid writing about the giant African land snail that can grow to the size of a fist isn't going to feature on the list because there was only one record in the training data. So the encoder took our text and then created, trained a model with the tokens as the output. In terms of modeling the relationship between the words, I guess you could do it like a graph where there's a relationship between things, but it would have so many nodes and edges. Plus, how would it work out for tokens, which not necessarily aren't a complete word, but might be parts of words. The machine would have to defer relationships. And this graph would be so massive and difficult to deal with, it wouldn't really be practical. So instead, relationships are vectors in a multi-dimensional space. And that's another term. So to simplify that, imagine you'd laid out your holiday photos from your trip to Africa on the table, and you wanted to put photos which are similar together. So you'd have the animal photos over there from the safari. Uh, we'd have that artistic photo of the concert on the beach. And there's that picture of my feet that I took. We'll put that over there. Uh, and then we've got the giant snail as well, which we saw. Now you could make it programmatic to say, okay, how similar are these things by measuring the distance between two photos on the table? And because we've got, I guess, two axes here, we've got two dimensions, X and Y. If you said that one is the top of the table and zero is the bottom, and then had another axis down the bottom, you could assign floating point values for the coordinates of each of the pictures. So uh, you'd have X and Y for the feet and for the snail, and you could measure the distance between the two things. That represents the position of that picture in our space, which is called the product space. In AI terms, this measurement is not done with a ruler, it's done using a similarity equation. And the one almost everyone is using right now is the cosine similarity function. Simply put, this equation draws a line from the point to zero, zero. And it does that for the two things you want to compare. And then you measure the angle between those lines and put that angle through the cosine function. That's why it's called cosine similarity. So cosine of 90 is zero, cosine of zero is one. So the closer the answer is to one, the closer the points are. Now the problem with our two dimensional space is that we've clustered together based on one characteristic, which was animals we saw on Safari. And if we trained an AI based on a two dimensional model, I might ask it about predators in sub-Saharan Africa, and it would list the mighty zebra. Or if I asked it about striped animals, it would confidently talk about the black and white striped lion. So two dimensions isn't really enough. Instead, the AI models have hundreds of dimensions. I could show you a three dimensional space with the pictures laid out, but it's more than three. It's over a thousand for OpenAI's model and our brain can't really visualize anything beyond three dimensions. You might also be wondering, well, what if they're far away, but the angle is small? Because then the cosine similarity would say, okay, these things are similar. Like if I said animals that have feet it would give me a human and a snail, but actually those two points are quite far away. So the embedding model has more dimensions than two, like I mentioned, and it's more of a multi-dimensional cone of points. Text ADA 3, the OpenAI text embedding model, has 1,536 dimensions. A massive benefit to cosine similarity is that you can use it not just to measure the angle between a point on a 2D axis, but you can give it any number of dimensions and it will give you a result between one and zero. Where it was zero is these things are far away and one is these things are close together. So if we go back to our fictional 2D dimensional embedding model, the vector is the list of positions for each dimension. And since we only have two, X and Y, the vector is two numbers. We have some text, we use an encoding to produce tokens with a byte pair encoder these tokens are given to an embedding model which returns a vector in its product space. We can compare two vectors using a similarity function like cosine similarity to show how related they are. Encoding the tokens or embeddings for a piece of data 
then getting the vector is time consuming and you don't want to work this out every time you compare some data. So you can do that ahead of time for each bit of text you want to measure, then you can quickly calculate the similarity between items in your data. This is a very crude explanation of what a vector database is. So you could, if you really wanted to, just add a field to a regular database, even just a table, and store the vector data that you got from your embedding model. You could then index all of your data points. And if you could have a search function to say, okay, what is the most similar thing to each item in the table? And you could calculate that ahead of time by running cosine similarity between each point and its neighbors. So why bother with all of this? Um, well, humans are vague. And one of the big advances in generative AI is that they can infer meaning from vague instructions. They can ignore our spelling and grammatical mistakes, and they don't behave like command lines. They're fuzzy, and to be fuzzy, they need all this apparatus to find similar meanings and text to predict what the answer will be. Another important reason you might come across is read augmented generation, which is a technique that applies tokenization, embeddings, and vector similarity, which we covered in this video, to a set of data that you provide. This could be something like your travel plans. So you would use a similarity search to improve the prompt to the AI. So if I asked it, what are some animals I might find in Africa? We could use read augmented generation to perform a similarity search on that against my vector database. And I can seed my vector database with whatever I like. This could be some relevant data. This could be some live data. It could be some stuff from an API. Uh, so in this example, I'm going to give my travel plans and I'm going to put all of my travel plans and bookings and stuff into a vector database so it can do a similarity search and say, oh, he's looking at things in Africa and a read augmented generation will append some contextual and important information to my prompt before giving it to the AI. So for my incredibly vague question, it might stick on the fact that I'm actually traveling to Zimbabwe in autumn and I'm going on safari. So the response that I'm going to get is going to be more accurate. And also you don't have to worry so much about the fact that the models have only been trained on data that was two or three years old. I think that's enough concepts for today. If you enjoyed this video, leave a comment with what else you'd like to learn and I'll see if I can make some more of these. Thanks.